Thank you very much, Jerry, for the kind introduction. So um, I'm a group leader at IMDEA Nanociencia in Madrid, uh, in uh, Spain. And uh, today my uh, talk will be based on the time-resolved electronic and structural study of uh, noble metal free photosensitizers, especially based on copper. And I will also elaborate on some studies that I have done where these uh, photosensitizers or light harvesting units were coupled with uh, solar fuel catalysts to help gain a complete electronic and structural scheme of the catalytic reactions. And lastly, I'll briefly touch upon the usage of uh, X-ray spectroscopic techniques that have recently been very valuable to help us understand the design of uh, a solar fuel catalyst on uh, hybrid uh, surfaces, so on uh, semiconductor and glassy carbon surfaces for the ultimate design of a synthetic device uh, for uh, water splitting reactions. Um, so just to illustrate the motivation behind my project, uh, so for some reason, I cannot go to the next slide. So stop share. Stop share. It doesn't allow me to go to the page then. Okay, I apologize for that. So in order to uh, summarize the motivation behind my project and the global motivation that, uh, that help us pursue the research that we're doing, as you know, coronavirus is not the only important thing. We also have the climate change issue going on. So if we take a look at our energy usage in the year 2000, so before and after, uh, the total primary power in the year 2000 uh, was around 12.8 terawatts. So this is a measure of the mean burn rate of all power consumed in the planet. And uh, this figure is expected to double and to be around 28 to 35 uh, terawatts. So uh, if we don't come up with alternative sources of energy, so one solution is to rely heavily on nuclear energy. So this means we have to start building around 8,000 nuclear plants. So starting from today, we have to build around one to two nuclear power plants per day, which is not really a viable option. So one possible alternative is to rely on the solar energy potential. And according to uh, the World Energy Assessment Report, we can practically harvest between 50 to 1500 of terawatt uh, of solar energy, depending on uh, land fraction per year. And um, the solar-driven splitting of uh, water into hydrogen is a very promising alternative to fossil fuels. Currently, we are using a lot of fossil fuels, which leads to a lot of environmental pollution. And also due to the rapid depletion of fossil fuels, it is important to come up with other alternative sources of energy. And uh, the solar splitting of water into hydrogen um, can be achieved by uh, photosystem two, by natural photosynthetic pigments, as you have uh, learned in previous talk. And an important uh, aspect of this uh, photosystem two is the uh, chromophore, which can absorb the incident photons. So this uh, incident photons uh, produces light energy and the light energy can be converted into an electronically excited state for the creation of a charge separated state that helps to provide the required thermodynamic force for subsequent catalytic reactions, such as water splitting into hydrogen and oxygen, which is, uh, which is a reaction that uh, requires a lot of energy. So the eventual goal and aim of this uh, project, as we see it, is to be able to uh, design homogeneous photocatalysts that can couple these uh, uh, one electron, one excited states between the photoactive unit and the catalyst. So the idea is to be able to couple one electron excited states to multi-electron, multi-fuel, multi-proton solar fuel catalysts and be able to do so with cheap and easily repairing materials. So in the development of these kinds of homogeneous photocatalysts, there have been two dominant strategies that we have been looking at. One is these uh, supramolecular assemblies. So in this case, you have a photoactive unit that is directly connected to a catalytic center. So light energy is absorbed here at the photoactive unit and is converted into chemical energy 
for charge accumulation processes at the catalytic center. And this happens in very one nice attractive assembly. And we also have these uh, multi-molecular systems which rely on the diffusional interactions between the catalyst and, uh, and the light harvester. And this typically happens in the order of uh, microsecond time scales and requires the usage of sacrificial electron donors or acceptors. So in this presentation, I will mainly focus on the characterization of these photoactive units that we have carried out. And later, I will also elaborate how we were able to couple these photosensitizers with these earth abundant uh, catalysts and use X-ray to understand the complete electron transfer dynamics as well as the uh, electronic and structural configurations occurring at the catalytic center all the way towards the hydrogen evolution reaction. And uh, currently the main problem is that commonly known uh, photosensitizers, typically, typically they consist of these uh, abundant, uh, not so abundant, uh, very scarce and very precious metals such as uh, ruthenium, uh, iridium, platinum and uh, Uranium. And the reason why these uh, photosensitizers are widely used is because they have a very broad uh, photoabsorption, they have very good emission properties, and they also demonstrate good redox potentials for electron transfer to the catalytic center. And uh, in addition to that, they, they demonstrate reasonable photostabilities when associated with a catalyst. But uh, over the course of the past years, we have witnessed a huge increase in the usage of these more uh, noble metal free photosensitizers, especially consisting of chromium, copper, and zinc. And in particular, we have witnessed a growth in the usage of these uh, copper uh, photosensitizers, in particularly the so-called HOMO, uh, as well as heteroleptic copper photosensitizers. So the difference that you will notice here between the homoleptic as well as the heteroleptic uh, photosensitizers is that the heteroleptic ones contain um, two distinct ligands. And so you can uh, vary the properties of these ligands in order to modulate their uh, emission lifetimes, their redox potential, and their photostabilities. In particular, these two distinct ligands, which is a diamine diphosphine uh, copper heteroleptic complex, uh, they have been modified uh, by, for example, by substituting the methyl groups at the 2-9-diamine position by bulkier substituents such as butyl groups. We have been able to efficiently increase both the photostability and also the excited state lifetimes by a factor of uh, close to 10, which is quite impressive. So it is very important for us to explore how to further improve these kinds of photocatalysts. Um, and uh, Unfortunately, and the main problem that we currently face with these kinds of uh, copper-based photosensitizers is that up and light excitation, uh, these photosensitizers are shown to undergo a structural reorganization from a pseudotetrahedral to a flattened state. So they adopt a more flattened state structure, which enables a nucleophilic attack by solvent molecules. Um, and this results into a formation of an exaplex, which is a low energy excited state that can quickly decay back to the ground state in the order of pico to nanosecond timescales. So uh, one of the ongoing aims in the design of these copper photosensitizers is to be able to improve the excited state lifetimes through incorporation of multi-dentate ligands. So the idea is if you have a copper photosensitizer with a multi-dentate ligand, this additional donor moiety can occupy the vacant site around the copper center. And as a result, uh, up and photo excitation, you have a pentacoordinated geometry and an increased coordination geometry, which helps to improve the stability of the excited state. So as a result, this increased coordination geometry and improved stability in the excited state can help prevent nucleophilic attack at the copper center in the excited state. And this can help prevent the formation of a low energy excited state known as an exaplex to be formed. So from this stems uh, the main idea of the first part of this presentation, which is why not design the excited state configuration of a photosensitizer, which can have a pentacoordinated copper one center. 
Um, so towards this aim, uh, we first started by designing a couple of photosensitizers with financial and ligands, uh, with new financial ligands of the type X and NX. So in this case, uh, these couple of photosensitizers contain uh, additional donor moieties with the methoxy, uh, methoxy group, as well as the thiomethyl group. And we investigated the impact of these multi-dentate ligands on the coordination behavior and the stability of both the homoleptic as well as the heteroleptic complexes. And in this case, uh, these heteroleptic ones, they also feature these additional uh, diphosphine ligands, which were shown to exhibit um, reasonable for the stabilities and also increase emission properties. So we decided to investigate whether the addition of these bulkier substituents can, can help further uh, improve the excited state lifetime and as well stabilize the coordination behavior in the excited state geometry. So uh, we started in our lab by doing uh, a range of characterization. So we investigated the nature of uh, these uh, couple photosensitizers through the usage uh, of a range of techniques. It was involved uh, UVV absorption and emission spectroscopy as well as electrochemistry to help us understand the basic photophysical uh, as well as electrochemical properties of these couple of complexes. But the important results and the one that I will present today is we were able to assess the solid state structures of these complexes uh, by carrying out X-ray diffraction analysis in the solid state. We also uh, did uh, steady state zanes and exaps to understand their behavior in solution. And importantly, uh, which will be the main part of this presentation, is we used uh, time-resolved X-ray absorption, uh, laser, laser pump, and X-ray probe spectroscopy in order to understand uh, the photophysical properties of these complexes in the PICO uh, to microsecond time scales. So in this case, a laser pulse initiates the reaction and an X-ray pulse is used as a probe in order to in interrogate the electronic and structural nature of the triplet excited states in the order of pico uh, seconds. And uh, we also carried out time-dependent DFT as well as uh, Zane's simulations in order to visualize our experimental evidence and to corroborate all our experimental findings as well with theory. So uh, I will just start with the analysis. So um, we first carried out X-ray diffraction analysis on all the four complexes. And uh, you'll notice here that all the kappa complexes described in the previous slide, they show a deviation from the ideal uh, tetrahedral geometry, which is typically expected for these kinds of kappa complexes, which are known to exhibit a distorted tetrahedral geometry. And notice that all the copper complexes show a significant deviation from the ideal 109.5 uh, degrees tetrahedral angle. And interestingly, um, both the heteroleptic complexes, whether they have a thiomethyl or a methoxy group, the bite, the, the bite angles and the, uh, and the torsional angles, they are very similar. Actually, the bite and the tetrahedral angles show minor deviations of at most eight degrees, if you look here, which shows that the different donor moieties, whether it is a thiomethyl or a methoxy group, does not largely impact the structural configurations of the heteroleptic complexes. And interestingly, also, uh, the heteroleptic complexes are more distorted as compared to the homoleptic ones. So the torsional angle, which is the angle between these two financial ligands, is higher in the heteroleptic complexes, around 84 to 87 degrees, as compared to that in the homoleptic ones, which is around 80 degrees. And what is more interesting uh, for us is that if we look at further examination of the bond length and, um, and the structure of these complexes already in the solid state, we notice that in uh, the homoleptic complex, we have one of the donor moiety that point towards the copper center, um, as opposed to the, all the donor moieties that point away from the copper center. And the respective uh, copper oxygen distance is also significantly shortened. It's around 3.17 Armstrong as compared to the other copper donor moiety distances, which are between 4.03 to 4.8 Armstrong. And by contrast, all the donor moieties uh, that we observed in the heteroleptic complexes, they all point away 
from the Kappa Center, maintaining the typical fourfold uh, tetraconal geometry. And this is interesting because this shows that already in the solid state, there's a weak interaction between the Kappa Center and one of the donor moiety of the homoleptic complexes. Um, and we also followed by carrying out the zanes and exacts of these complexes in the solution state. So these measurements were carried out at the advanced photon source uh, last year um, uh, at sector 20. So in this case, we always uh, do careful, um, careful assessment of the complexes in solution phase before moving on to the time-resolved X-ray spectroscopic analysis. So the measurements were carried out in this case in a continuous helium flow cryostat at uh, 20 Kelvin. So near the finger uh, that you see here, you have the uh, helium cryostat where the samples are being placed and they were placed at 45 degrees to the incoming beam and measured in fluorescence uh, mode using a solid state detector. In this case, we use the 13 element uh, uh, germanium detector. And uh, you all know this, but just briefly, because I will uh, provide a lot of results, a lot of zanes and exact results, so, so you understand the context. Uh, the data is first obtained in energy space. It is then converted into photoelectron case space and then Fourier transformed. And in this case, the first coordination sphere of the homoleptic complex corresponds to the average copper nitrogen distance and the subsequent coordination sphere corresponds to the more gregarious copper carbon distances. Um, and uh, what is really interesting is that we can already determine the coordination geometry of all these complexes simply by looking at the zane spectra. So for example, all of the, the zanes of all of these complexes, they have a distinct shoulder between 8984 to 8987EV, which corresponds to the 1s to 4pz transition where the 4p is localized on the, on the copper with a tetragonal or a square planar geometry. And uh, also you notice that uh, we don't see any pre-edge features. So the presence of pre-edge features typically consists uh, of 1s to 3d transitions, which are formally dipole forbidden, but they gain intensity as a result of the 3d to 4p mixing. In this case, it is important to note that copper one is a 3d 10 system uh, with no vacancy in the D level. So as a result, we observed uh, a lack of a pre-edge feature. But importantly, uh, the Zane spectra of all the four kappa complexes show small changes uh, in the rising edge features, which indicate uh, small variations in the local coordination geometry and the local symmetry, as we have already corroborated through X-ray diffraction analysis. Uh, we also measured the exacts of all the four copper complexes, and in this case, uh, we observe a prominent peak at around 1.5 to 1.8 apparent distance in the first coordination sphere. And this peak consists of the average copper nitrogen and phosphorus contribution. So in this case, even though we cannot distinguish between the copper nitrogen and the copper phosphorus contributions, uh, we do see that upon analysis of the exacts, addition of the two copper phosphorus distances does improve the quality of the fit considerably. So uh, analysis of the exact fit shows uh, the homoleptic complexes to display four copper nitrogen distances at around 2.03 Armstrong. On the other hand, for the heteroleptic complexes, we are able to observe an improvement of the fit upon inclusion of the two elongated copper phosphorus distances at uh, 2.30 to 2.30. 2.28 Armstrong. And what is interesting is that, um, and also important here, is that uh, the extraction of the distances from our experimental exact analysis agree very well with the X-ray diffraction results and as well as with the DFT optimization calculations that we did. And this showed that uh, our theoretical approaches can be reliably used for understanding the excited state geometry and that our experimental approach is correct. Uh, I would like to stop here to ask if you have any questions. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll start off while people are typing their questions into chat. Uh, one of the main reasons for the synthesis you're doing, or the two main reasons, are to try to increase the lifetime for the photo excitation and to prevent this solvent poisoning of the, uh, the copper site. 
Yes, um, exactly. Mm -hmm. what, what range of lifetimes is actually desirable? I understand that if the lifetime is too short, then there won't be very much catalytic activity. But if the lifetime is too long, it feels like you could either bleach or give more opportunity for damage of the copper site. So what is a good range of lifetime? So the lifetimes that we aim for is in the order of uh, microseconds. So for instance, the ruthenium based photosensitizers that we have uh, previously coupled with a uh, solar fuel catalyst, uh, they exhibit long lifetime in the order of several microseconds. And this allow for efficient electron transfer from the excited state to the catalytic center to happen. Uh, in this case, uh, the ideal lifetime we would like would be several microseconds, especially in the multimolecular system, because these are diffusion limited reactions. So when we excite the right. copper photosensitizer, the excited state has to find the, the catalyst for, the, for, for any electron transfer to occur. So, yeah, it would be in that order. Okay. And what, what, uh, um, what had the lifetime been before you uh, started the synthesis, what were the typical ranges of lifetimes for the copper photosensitizers? So the, the copper photosensitizers with the longest lifetime was, uh, it was shown last year, uh, it was 1.1 microsecond. Uh, and we were trying to go beyond that, beyond that limit. That was a Zanfos uh, copper photosensitizer with uh, batocuproin and a Zanfos ligand. So it had a dark diphosphine ligands and also these, um, uh, these bulky methyl groups. So it, upon photo excitation, uh, they help to prevent a nucleophilic attack by, uh, by any solvent molecules. So yeah, it, it was 1.1 microseconds. Okay. You had that great slide about the torsion angle and the difference between the uh, homoelectronic versus heteroelectronic. Um, uh, how should I be thinking about the importance of that torsion angle for a final function of the photosensitizer. Uh, okay, so upon photo excitation, uh, the copper photosensitizer, uh, the idea is that it turns into a more flattened state. When, once it's excited, it has a tendency to adopt a more flattened geometry in the, in the copper to formal excited state. So if it's, uh, if it's completely flattened, then that means in a square planar geometry, the torsional angle between the two phenantrolin, between the two ligands will be zero. Uh, so you want it to be, uh, you want this angle to be high, to be distorted tetrahedral, close to 109.5, not close to zero. So the higher the, the distortion, the better. The higher the torsional okay. angle, the higher the distortion, the better. Okay, but wasn't the, I thought that slide was for ground state rather than excited state, or did I misunderstand? Uh, that was just for ground state. I have not gone through the excited ah. state results yet. <laughs> of course. All right. <laughs> then I, uh, I look forward to learning about the excited state and you should continue. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. So following we did the time resolved uh, uh, laser pump X-ray probe uh, spectroscopy. Um, and uh, in this case, the sample is uh, flown into the continuous uh, liquid jet and we continuously degas with nitrogen. We use here, you will notice, probably you're familiar with this setup. It's the time resolved X-ray uh, pump probe setup at 11 IDD at Argonne National Lab. And we have found this setup to be especially useful uh, because uh, it, uh, the samples can be contained in a hermetically well-sealed chamber. And this is very important because in this case, we want to ensure that the triplet excited states are not being exposed to oxygen, which can eff effectively quench uh, their lifetimes. And in this case, all, all the laser conditions, such as the power, the spot size, and the repetition rate, they are all optimized in order to provide uh, maximum excitation in each uh, probe volume while allowing the sample to be excited uh, shot by shot. So it is important to also note that we carry all our experiments in the 24 bunch timing mode uh, that is uh, commonly used at the APS. So in this case, the X-rays are 80 to 90 picosecond pulse duration, and they are interbunch spaced by 153 nanosecond. So if you synchronize the first pulse of the laser and the X-ray uh, pulse, 
the first X-ray and the laser pulse you can get over multiple X-ray pulse in order to measure the ensuring photodynamics all the way from uh, atypical segment in this case, which was the pulse duration of the X-rays to several microsegment time scales. And this kind of timing mode, which is the 24 bunch mode, is very important because into, it takes into account important factors such as uh, the time scale for the dynamics on the study, the replenishing time, and also the temporal response of the detector. And it is also important to know that uh, this beamline has an automated uh, digitization system which allows for all X-ray pulses after photo excitation to be measured. So this means that if we average multiple X-ray pulses upon photo excitation, we can get a better resolution of the pre-edge and the rising edge regions, especially in these kinds of diffusion uh, limited photocatalytic system where the transient signal is very weak. And uh, also, um, Usually in a hydrogen evolution system, you have several catalytic intermediates that you have to monitor before the eventual uh, hydrogen evolution reaction occurs. So by, by looking at several bunches all the way to pico to microsegment time scale, you can monitor the growth, the decay, and the, and the, and, and the rising of another intermediate. So this is very important, especially in photocatalytic applications. Uh, and in our case, we, we measured the samples in fluorescence mode, but by using two avalanche photodiodes, which are located at 90 degrees to the jet. And we use the combination of Z minus uh, one filters and solar slits to reduce uh, the background from elastically scattered X-rays. And uh, upon laser excitation, we have uh, the following phenomenon that happens. So um, we have electron that is promoted from the 3D shell to the pi star orbital of the ligand. Uh, this uh, process is followed by, in, by flattening distortion and intersystem crossing uh, to formation of a triplet excited states. So all these processes happen in the sub 80 picosecond time scales. So if we look at our transient signal, which we're able to observe at the synchrotron within the 80 picosecond pulse duration of the X-rays, we can get that by subtracting the laser on and the laser off uh, signal. And this transient signal that you see here corresponds to the formation of the triplet excited states. And uh, interestingly, we see a prominent peak at around 9003 EV, which corresponds to the formation of the uh, formerly kappa 2 excited state. And uh, interestingly, not only do we observe a reduction of the ligand and oxidation of the formal kappa 2 center, we also observed uh, interesting changes at low photon energies in the pre-edge area, which corresponds to a change in the coordination environment and the local electronic configuration. And, and this is very interesting because note that in this case, an electron is promoted from the 3D level. Kappa 1 is, is, is uh, initially 3D10. But upon uh, light excitation, we have electron promoted to the pi star ligand of the phenanthrolin. Uh, so the kappa essentially becomes 3D9. So this change in the D level atomic arrangement is accompanied by uh, uh, increased hybridization of the 3D with the 4P orbitals, which explains the, the pre-edge feature uh, which comes into play. And uh, the transient signal in this case, in the case of the heteroleptic complexes, they were sufficiently high that we were able to actually resolve the exacts, which was quite exciting. And uh, we were able to determine the percentage excitation of these complexes by comparing the experimental Zanes spectrum with the theoretically de derived one. And in this case, we concluded that the heteroleptic complexes had an excitation fraction uh, between eight to 10%. So uh, to determine the structure of the reconstructed excited state is very easy. You simply subtract 88 to 90% of the ground state from the laser on spectrum. And this allows you to reconstruct the exafts of the excited state. And the derived excited states now contain two prominent peaks in the first coordination sphere, which corresponds to the shortened uh, copper nitrogen and much more elongated copper phosphorus distances. Um, and analysis of the reconstructed excited state so we're able to derive, we're able to extract two copper uh, nitrogen distances at around 2.00 Armstrong and two elongated 
uh, kappa phosphorus distances at around 2.35. Anstrom. And this was really exciting for us because uh, these heteroleptic complexes, they are known to, to degrade uh, during photocatalysis. They have been known to degrade into their homoleptic counterparts during photocatalysis, but never really understood why. And the structure of these uh, excited states provide a first hint to their uh, ligand dissociation and degradation pathways. So the shortening of the copper nitrogen distances, but importantly, the elongation of the copper phosphorus distances could be a first hint towards their decomposition pathway. So this could be the first step leading to their decomposition to their homoleptic uh, parts. And this allows us to think of future possibilities to further improve the excited state geometry and help prevent their decomposition. Um, and uh, interestingly, we observed the same pattern for the heteroleptic complex bearing the methoxy group. So uh, we observe again two peaks, less prominent, but still around the same distances. At, at around 2.02 and 2.34 Armstrong. So in this case, a similar pattern is observed, which shows that the different donor moiety, whether it is a methoxy or a thiomethyl group, it doesn't have a large impact on the on both the ground state and the excited state configurations of these uh, copper-based photosensitizers. Um, what was for us most interesting is that uh, the homoleptic complexes, by contrast, shows extremely different time resolved Zane spectra as compared to the homo as compared to the heteroleptic complexes. So notice here that um, if you look at the difference uh, in the time resolved Zane spectrum, the homoleptic complex just shows a decrease in the pre-edge intensity, as well as a single negative transition peak at 8987 EV. Uh, and both the decrease in the pre-edge feature as well as the single negative transition peak uh, observed for the homoleptic relative to the heteroleptic ones show that we have a, a change in the coordination geometry. If we think back in literature, uh, a decrease in the pre-edge intensity corresponds to an increase in the coordination number due to a decrease in the dipole allowed 1s to 4p character contributing to this transition, uh, as explained by Solomon. And uh, this uh, negative transition peak also explained that the that the coordination geometry is no longer localized. It's, it's not a tetragonal geometry because uh, remember, the couple one complexes, they show a distinct shoulder feature uh, along the Zane spectrum, which corresponds to the 1s to 4pz transition. But if you have um, a change in the coordination geometry, this leads to a greater delocalization of the 4p orbitals, so uh, which leads in turn to a broader negative transition peak. So both the broader 1s to 4p transition and the decrease in the pre-edge intensity indicates that we have an increase in the coordination geometry. And we were able to check our findings by carrying out uh, theoretical calculations. So we did both uh, time-dependent uh, DFT as well as Zane's simulations and our time-dependent um, uh, DFT calculations indeed show that we have a significantly shortened copper oxygen uh, distance from the donor moiety at around 2.2 uh, to 2.47 Armstrong. So this indicates that we really have a contact between the copper and the donor moiety in the excited state configuration. And uh, I also did uh, some uh, time-dependent Zane simulations using ORCA, and the general trends that I observed from the theoretical simulations agree with the experimental results, which serve to show that we, we are able to achieve our goal, which is a pentacoordinated uh, configuration in the excited state geometry of these uh, homoleptic complexes. And it is important to note here that um, that we were not able to extract the exacts of these, uh, of these um, homoleptic complexes because of their low excited state fraction, less than 5% in this case. However, the pre-edge features together with the rising edge Zanes features already provide a fingerprint of the local coordination geometry of these excited state structures uh, and help us uh, understand the structure better. Um, we also carried out the time-resolved X-ray kinetics of these uh, homoleptic and heteroleptic complexes. And unfortunately, as you notice, uh, the, we observed the prompt formation of these uh, of, of the transient signal within the pulse duration of the X-rays within a typical second. However, they decay very fast. And we do not observe a transient signal anymore after, uh, after AT picosecond. Uh, and by contrast, the heteroleptic uh, complexes show a persistent transient state signal 
uh, up to 240 nanoseconds and 77 nanoseconds, uh, depending on the methoxy of a fire methyl uh, group coordination. And we think that the shorter excited state lifetimes of these homoleptic complexes, as opposed to the heteroleptic ones, is due to the presence of this uh, bulky diphosphine ligand, which shows here to be an important uh, factor in increasing the steric demands of these complexes in their excited state conformation. So um, we have achieved our goal, which was to achieve a pentacoordinated geometry and the excited state conformation, but we do need to do further fine tuning strategies that we are currently working on in order to improve the lifetime beyond the pico to nanosecond timescale. Um, and I also want to briefly touch upon further studies that we have carried out by coupling uh, the more commonly known graphenium bipyridine photosensitizer, which in this case is very robust and has a uh, high emission lifetimes, together with this uh, solar, uh, solar fuel catalyst. And in this case, we use the range of complexes from cobalt to nickel. And by coupling the ruthenium BP photosensitizers with these cobalt and nickel catalysts, we were able to map uh, a complete photocatalytic cycle. And we were able to determine step-by-step uh, -step, a complete electronic, structural, and kinetic scheme of the complete photocatalytic reactions. Uh, recently, we also did some further studies of these ruthenium BP photosensitizer with uh, nickel-based catalysts, which is very similar to uh, the nickel hydrogenase, uh, the, the biological mimic of hydrogenase in nature, and uh, this was featured in, uh, in a Chemistry European Journal. Um, so um, I will also explain briefly about some recent efforts that we have carried out in applying X-ray absorption spectroscopy to understand the design of photoanodes uh, for the engineering of a synthetic light to fuel device. So you have observed in the previous slides that we invest a lot of efforts in coupling these photosensitizers, uh, trying to understand the excited state behaviors and uh, trying, to, trying to couple them with solar fuel catalysts. But all of, these, uh, all of these studies are carried out in the liquid phase and we use these uh, sacrificial electron donors or acceptors. But if we want to think in the future of a viable water splitting system, we need to start thinking about immobilizing catalysts on electrode surfaces, on semiconductors or other electrode surfaces. And this is an example that you can see here of an N-type and a P-type semiconductor. And in this case, uh, this uh, system can absorb visible light to generate electron hole pairs. And you can have, for example, a water oxidation catalyst that can uh, capture the holes in the valence band of the N-type semiconductor to drive water molecule to produce oxygen gas. And you can also have a proton reduction catalyst that can capture the electrons in the conduction band of the P-type semiconductor to reduce protons to molecular hydrogen. Um, and uh, and in, in thinking along these, uh, these uh, goals, we have recently designed, uh, in collaboration with um, some researchers in Catalonia, uh, new ruthenium water oxidation oligomers that were absorbed uh, massively on uh, graphitic carbon surfaces via CH pi interactions. And uh, we used, and this is a new anchoring strategy which proved to, which proved the catalyst to have uh, very high turnover numbers. And we evaluated the fate of these uh, uh, ruthenium water oxidation uh, oligomers through X-ray absorption spectroscopy both before and after bulk catalysis. And we compare it with the exacts of uh, ruthenium oxide that you see here in uh, pink. And interestingly, our ruthenium catalyst does not show any degradation to ruthenium oxide, which was, uh, which was very important in this case, because this shows the molecular intact nature of our catalyst after bulk catalysis, which is very important. Oftentimes, most of the catalysts that are reported in literature, instead of maintaining the molecular nature, they are actually forming oxide materials. And if we want to correlate the reactivity of these complexes with the catalytic process, uh, then it turns out to be a futile effort. And uh, we were also able to determine through zines that I don't show here, but the electronic nature of these catalysts also after uh, bulk electrolysis. We also carried out further study uh, and extended our results to studying on non-toxic of abundant uh, catalysts based on iron. And in this case, we studied an iron pentanuclear catalyst, which is based on a tetradentate uh, uh, tetraionic dinucleating ligand that is shown here. 
And uh, this catalyst was actually already reported in Nature by a group in Japan. And in their studies, they reported the, the catalyst to have very impressive turnover numbers and catalytic activities. But uh, when we synthesized the same catalyst and we studied it through X-ray spectroscopy, we find that after ball catalysis at increasing electrochemical potential, the catalyst actually degrades and turn into an active oxide material. So the cyan curve that you, that you see here, that's actually the zanes of the iron oxide. And also the exacts of this catalyst after bulk electrocatalysis is actually not intact at all. It actually it's degrading and slowly turning into the iron oxide material. And this was also important and published. It was accepted recently in iScience. And it helps to show that we really need a sophisticated not sophisticated, but at least in depth spectroscopic uh, analysis, ex especially using X ray approaches in order to understand uh, the nature of these catalysts um, better. Um, lastly, I would like to briefly talk about spin crossover complexes because this was in the title of my original presentation. It is unrelated to this topic, but uh, our institution at TIMDEA, we do encourage a lot of synergistic collaborations between physicists, chemists, and uh, material scientists. And towards this aim, we also uh, recently spent some time in studying um, spin crossover complexes, which as you know, is very extensively studied by the group of Shagri in Switzerland. But in our case, our studies are, are a bit different because we find that uh, in this case, that the macrocyclic ligand arrangement is very important in such kind of spin crossover complexes for uh, data storage uh, device applications. And by using combined optical transient absorption spectroscopy with time resolved X ray absorption spectroscopy and TDDFT calculations, we were able to map a complete electronic and energetic scheme of all the different intermediates involved in the spin crossover reactions. And we found in this case that one way to improve the lifetime of the excited state of these complexes is first by introducing a microcyclic ligand arrangement. And this helps to stabilize a seven coordinated geometry. So our complex you will notice have lifetimes in the order of microseconds, as opposed to all the other spin crossover complexes that have been reported to demonstrate lifetimes in the order of pico to nanosecond timescale. Um, so in summary, um, uh, we have uh, been able to resolve the ground and excited state structures of copper-based photosensitizers with uh, novel phenantrolin ligands. And we have investigated the impact of the donor moieties on their excited state configurations. We have also a couple, uh, some of the more commonly known ruthenium photosensitizers with uh, nickel-based uh, uh, hydrogen evolving catalysts and use uh, X-ray spectroscopic techniques to understand the catalytic reactions. We um, further investigated the usage of uh, X-ray spectroscopic techniques to help us understand the design of photo anodes for the uh, engineering of a synthetic light to fuel devices, either by studying ruthenium or iron water oxidation catalysts that are anchored on multi-world carbon nanotubes. And we are open to collaborations. And one of our efforts is also to uh, collaborate with material scientists towards understanding other systems. Uh, one of the systems that we investigated was in this case a spin crossover uh, complex. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the efforts invested by all the collaborators and group members, uh, in particular, my student, uh, Siama Iglesias and uh, Lucia Velasco. Um, also, Juliet, she's a bit underage. She's, she's still not coming to beam times, but she's very active. And also my uh, collaborators, uh, Jawi, uh, who's a very good collaborator of mine at the IPS, and uh, our synthetic chemist who we are working with uh, <laughs> to, to help synthesize these uh, complexes, which have been very, uh, very important for our studies. Thank you very much for your kind attention. And any questions? Thank you. There's definitely questions. Um, we'll start with a question from Yulia. Okay. Hello, Dushe. Very nice to hear you talk. Very impressive results. I think your tenure might be a settled question, <laughs> hopefully. 
Um, yeah, very nice. So I have two questions. So uh, CAPA results, CAPA photosensitizers results are very interesting. So do you have an idea about redox levels and what kind of catalysis you can run with those? And also, did you look into integrating those into the metal organic frameworks? Because we are integrating now ruthenium complexes in there. And I think it would be very interesting um, research and probably we can even, you know, provide some assistance with uh, making these uh, samples um, to see if you put those photosensitizers into metal organic framework into inside those well-controlled pores how it will change their photodynamic? Would it uh, kind of stabilize certain states? I think it might be very interesting direction. Yeah, so we, unfortunately we have not. We have not start, started studying, started integrating these complexes into MOFs yet. Uh, we, uh, we sort of moved towards studying new copper photosensitizers with macrocyclic ligand arrangements now because we were a bit discouraged by their short excited state lifetimes, which in this case are in the order of uh, PICO to less than 10 nanosecond timescales. So we have not uh, studied them with, uh, with uh, proton reduction catalysts yet. And we also have not integrated these complexes into, into MOF assemblies yet. So uh, yeah, unfortunately we have been studying more uh, the integration of ruthenium based photosensitizers with solar fuel catalysts, but not copper ones. But, but we are of course interested uh, <laughs> for further discussion. I, I don't have too much experience with integrating these complexes into MOF assemblies. Uh, but uh, okay, we can kind of check the literature whether other people already have done uh, analysis of the effect of the MOF environment on excited state dynamics. So potentially it can be interesting. Mm -hmm. okay. And in terms, of mm -hmm. in terms of redox states, uh, the copper photosensitizers can definitely uh, drive hydrogen evolution, yeah? Yes. Uh it can. So the Zanfos uh, copper photosensitizer, I, I can send you the paper. It is uh, the one with the batocuproin and the Zanfos ligand. I was telling Jerry it has lifetime of 1.1 micros microsecond. And we have uh, coupled those photosensitizer with iron-based uh, proton reduction catalysts, iron decacarbonyl, and uh, the catalytic activities have already been reported. I, I can send you the literature if you would like. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. All right, um, Ben, you had a question? Yeah, uh, this is Ben Van Kuyken. Uh, Duche, uh, nice talk. I just uh, was curious with the pentacoordinated uh, copper uh, complex that you observed, how do you distinguish um, between a solvent associated species and like an intramolecular interaction? Um, so for the pentacoordinated complex, we, we are quite sure that we have an interaction between the copper donor moiety because we did additional uh, DFT calculations to show that we indeed have this, uh, this shortened copper oxygen distance at around uh, 2.25 Armstrong. And this is also corroborated with our time-resolved exact uh, experiments. But also all of our, experience, all of our uh, measurements are, ca are carried out in non-coordinating solvent. So we use a THF, uh, not acetonitrile. So the possibility of a solvent coordinating to, to it, it's, uh, it's very low. In this okay. case, toluene and THF, they are, they are usually non-coordinating solvents. So we are sure in that case that we have this uh, copper oxygen interaction from the thiomethyl and the methoxy group. Okay, thanks for the clarification. Thank you. Okay, I have a question. Um, you uh, were able to determine the fraction of photoexcited species in your time-resolved XAF study and used that to extract the extended XAFs of the excited state. Um, so how sensitive are your final scientific conclusions to exactly knowing the fraction of, uh, of uh, photoexcited species? Um, so in this case, uh, the way that I determine the excited state fraction is that I compare the experimental uh, zines with the theoretically derived zines. 
And uh, of course, it's not the most uh, accurate method to determine the excited state fraction. But uh, for instance, the difference that I observed in this case for these heteroleptic complexes between the laser off and the reconstructed laser on was in the order of 2 EV, which is typically what is observed for these kinds of uh, copper photosensitizers. So I, I concluded from this study that, uh, that the excited state fraction was in this case reliable. I have to say that uh, in the past, I used a range of excitation fraction ranging from 10 to 20% and the exafs in this case, I didn't find large difference. If I assume 10% or 15%, the differences are very minor. I see. So I, yeah, I think that the excited state fraction is important to have a rough value, but it's not so critical for extracting the, the distances. Okay. We, we, we get similar distances. That makes good sense. Thank you. One last question. If you can go, um, uh, if you can go back to the uh, microscopy picture that showed the ruthenium polymerized uh, uh, catalyst. Yes. Yeah, there was a question if you could just clarify what we should be uh, inferring from the picture with the, the zipper dots. <laughs> uh, what should we be seeing there? So this was an STM image that was that was collected by our collaborator in Germany. And in this case, uh, what you should see is that this is a water oxidation oligomer that consists of 15 units. And these are two dots that you see here. Uh, he did the calculation and he concluded that the that the that the that the distance between the oligomer one and oli that, uh, the, the catalyst one and catalyst two along the uh, chain length of this oligomer was 11 angstrom. So this, uh, this dash that you see here, you should, uh, I mean, you should use that if you have the expertise to determine the distance between the individual ruthenium atoms along the chain. <laughs> Very good. All right, and there's a last question about whether you know the water concentration within the toluene solvent. Uh, no, it was THF. It was not toluene. It was THF, tetrahydrofluorine. Okay, very good. Yes.